It starts as a normal day at one of America's biggest oil refineries. 1,800 people are busy at work. Without warning, a massive explosion rocks the plant. The blast is felt eight kilometers away. Dozens of people are injured, 15 are dead. A desperate rescue operation gets underway. America's worst industrial disaster for 15 years shatters a close-knit community. Now, a team of investigators must work out exactly what went wrong. Human error, design flaw, or terrorist attack. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. North America, Texas, the Gulf of Mexico. Every second, America burns nearly 4,000 gallons of gasoline, almost half the world's production. Much of it passes through this complex of refineries, the beating heart of the nation's gas-addicted economy. On the front line of this multi-billion dollar industry, 56 kilometers southeast of Houston lies Texas City. Here, 40,000 people live, clustered around three giant refineries. One of them belongs to the world's second biggest oil company, British Petroleum, or BP. It provides jobs for 1,800 workers and sprawls over a massive five square kilometers. Every day, it processes up to 11 million gallons of gasoline. This huge quantity of flammable liquid brings with it constant danger. The oil industry has strict safety guidelines, and with good reason. There might have been some other explosions. I'll, I'm... That just exploded. That was uh, three pipes. Since the 1970s, more than 100 oil workers have died in industrial accidents across America. BP's Texas City refinery has a checkered safety record. Workers have been killed here on at least six separate occasions. In September 2004, two workers were scalded to death. The Occupational Health and Safety Authority found BP guilty of a willful violation of industry safety guidelines. BP now claims to have put its house in order. There is no limit to the amount of activity that we've undertaken in Texas City to make it a very safe plant. But since 9-11, there's a new threat. Growing demand for gasoline has left America with little spare capacity. An attack here could cripple the world's biggest economy. As a result, the FBI now regards this group of refineries as one of the top five terrorist targets in the United States. At 2 a.m., night shift operators at the BP refinery work on a distillation tower. For the last month, the tower has been shut down for routine maintenance. This usually happens once every few years, now its operators must start it up again. The process can take up to 12 hours, and much of it has to be done manually. The risk of human error makes it one of the most dangerous jobs in any refinery. The tower's function is to distill raw fuel into its heavier and lighter components. On its way into the tower, the liquid is heated by a furnace and the lighter components evaporate. The vapor rises to the top of the tower and is channeled out through a pipe. It then passes through a condenser and returns to liquid before being pumped away. This will be added to gasoline to make it more potent. Meanwhile, the heavier residue left at the bottom of the tower is siphoned off. This will be used to make products such as tar, if the distillation process creates too much vapor, operators can lower the pressure by venting excess gases. 
These eventually reach a safety outlet or blowdown stack. An hour later, an alarm goes off in the control room. The liquid in the tower is above the recommended level. Against safety guidelines, the operator kills the alarm and continues filling the tower for another 15 minutes. It's an unofficial but routine shortcut, which has been taken many times before. At 5 a.m., an hour before sunrise, construction engineer David Crow arrives at work. David's office is in a 20-meter trailer within sight of the blowdown stack. Though he's only worked at the BP refinery for the last eight months, David and his wife Georgine have become close friends with his fellow workers. They were all buddies. There was no problems. Uh, Everybody got along. Among David's friends are James and Linda Rowe. By 10 minutes to 10, there's been a change of shift at the distillation tower. The computer shows the liquid level has dropped to normal. The supervisor now decides to move on to the next phase of the startup process. An operator starts to feed more fuel into the tower. Minutes later, the supervisor receives a phone call. His son has broken his arm at school. He hands over control to a colleague. At 10 a.m., operators light burners on the tower's furnace. This starts the distillation process by heating the liquid feeding into the tower. From this point on, most functions are automated. The most risky part of the process is over. 12.40 p.m. Everything seems to be going normally. Then a high pressure alarm goes off. Operators check the tower's level indicator and find nothing wrong. They conclude the distillation process must be producing too much vapor. To slow it down, they turn off two of the burners on the furnace, lowering the temperature of the feed into the tower. They also vent excess gas into the safety outlet or blowdown stack. As expected, the pressure begins to fall. Just before 1 p.m., workers relax within sight of the distillation tower. It's been a week without accidents, and to reward the workforce for their safety record, BP's management buys them lunch. As the workers enjoy their food, a white pickup truck approaches the main processing unit. It's one of many trucks in the refinery, and nobody pays it any attention. Among the workers are Ralph Dean and his wife, Alyssa. Ralph has been employed here for eight months as a rigging supervisor. Alyssa is 32 and works as an office manager in the nearby trailer. Lunch is the one time they get to see each other. And we just having a great time. Free lunch, free food, construction workers, yeah, it was great. As the workers finish their food, David Crow rounds them up for a routine maintenance meeting. Alyssa joins them in the trailer. As she does so, the white pickup truck parks near the blowdown stack. The driver leaves the engine running and slips away unseen. Although they don't realize it, the workers are now in terrible danger. And one of the world's biggest oil refineries is on the brink of catastrophe. At the BP refinery in Texas City, operators have been starting up a distillation tower for the last 11 hours. The high-risk procedure 
seems to be going to plan. But at nearly 20 past one, workers become alarmed. They spot a pool of liquid seeping under a white pickup truck. They can't be sure what it is, but the chances are it's flammable. Worse still, the pickup's engine is revving loudly and the driver is nowhere to be seen. Workers run for cover, fearing the worst. Nearby, Ralph Dean is operating a forklift. His wife Alyssa is in a trailer with 21 other workers, including her friends David, Linda and James. None of them hear the disturbance outside. that loud, extremely violent. It was biblical. As far as Ralph can see, the refinery is ablaze. The impact of the blast is felt eight kilometers away. Just outside Texas City, David Crow's wife Georgine is busy at work. Within minutes of the explosion, local TV stations broadcast pictures of the burning refinery. In case anyone is just joining us, you are looking at live pictures from Texas City. Georgine can't mistake her husband's workplace. Your heart is racing. My stomach started feeling queasy. I don't know, I think I wanted to scream. It becomes clear this is a major disaster. In a panic, Georgine phones her husband, David. There's no answer from his mobile phone, nor from the landline in the trailer. The concern now that perhaps the fatality count, uh, unfortunately, could be going up. Dazed by the explosion, Ralph Dean suddenly realizes his wife would have felt the full impact of the blast. But when he races to the trailer, he finds nothing left. Alyssa is nowhere to be seen. I can't recall feeling anything. The single thought that I can remember the whole time was find her and get out. David Crow was also in the trailer. He's knocked unconscious by the blast and now lies trapped beneath the debris. He's seriously hurt. He's fractured his foot, his heel is crushed, and he's broken six vertebrae. But if he doesn't move quickly, he'll burn to death. As he regains consciousness, David tries desperately to free himself. Despite his crippling injuries, he drags himself clear of the immediate danger, but he's still surrounded by flames. As David looks for an escape route, he sees Ralph searching for his wife, Alyssa. Neither of the men can make sense of their surroundings. There was nothing you could recognize, nothing. Everything was just torn to bits. It was uh, probably outside the military, the worst thing you'll ever see. It was hell on earth. Meanwhile, Eva Rowe is on her way to visit her parents, James and Linda. She lives near Dallas, a four-hour drive away, and doesn't see them as much as she would like. It's just a few days to Easter, and she's looking forward to spending the holiday with her family. I was in a really good mood, just driving along, enjoying the day. Eva has no idea about the explosion, or that her parents were caught in the blast, along with Ralph's wife, Alyssa, and Georgine's husband, David. Not all of them 
will survive. A lot of people are uh, pretty shook up about this. You could literally feel the ground and the wind is shaking. We felt it, and then we ran outside and we saw it. It almost knocked me down. Like an earthquake. Two hundred firefighters descend on the refinery. The scene, to me, looked like a nuclear explosion had gone off. It just wiped everything out. There are things I saw that day that most people will never see in their lifetime and hopefully never will. Emergency services have to act fast. Millions of gallons of flammable materials are within meters of the fire. David Crow lies crippled, choking on the lethal fumes. Then, two colleagues stumble across him and drag him to safety. How in the world did I get out of that? Why me? Why was I spared? I believe we all have guardian angels. And uh, one was with me that day. The paramedics will initially work on this scene to stabilize the most seriously injured and then prepare the patients for immediate transport to the nearest hospital, either by life flight or by ambulance. Every available helicopter and dozens of ambulances race the victims to hospitals. David Crow's wife, Georgine, learns that her husband is alive. When she sees him, she's shocked by the state he's in. He looked like he had been tied to a car and drugged down a road. I told him, I love you. And I'm glad you're still here. But not everyone is clear of the danger. Ralph Dean continues the desperate search for his wife, Alyssa. All I can think of is digging. It's like I'm digging and I'm not getting anywhere. Then, just as his efforts seem hopeless, he sees debris he recognizes from his wife's office. Beneath it, he finds a body. It's Alyssa, and she's still breathing. She's unconscious, but alive. A piece of heavy furniture has shielded her from the blast and saved her life. But James and Linda Rowe, who were also in the trailer, are still missing. Their daughter, Eva, now only 45 minutes from Texas City, has no idea there has been an explosion. There has been apparently a major explosion. We understand uh, from one of the witnesses who called us that it is at the BP refinery. When she hears the news, she immediately calls her mother, but gets no response. I knew that something was wrong because she always answered. And that time she didn't. I wish she would have. I wish she would have answered. Back at the blast site, it takes firefighters more than two hours to extinguish the blaze. America's third biggest refinery is left a smoldering wreck. In total, 170 people are injured, 15 are dead. 11 died in the trailer, but it's still not clear if Eva's parents are among them. Many of the bodies are so burnt they can't be identified by sight. The following day, 
Eva's asked to provide her parents' medical records. She finally learns that neither of them survived. I began trembling immediately, like my whole body was just shaking uncontrollably. My hands, my arms, my legs. I couldn't force myself to be still. And it didn't go away for over six months. The trembling didn't go away. Survivors of the blast are also traumatized. I guess what probably haunts me more than anything, I wasn't able to do anything. For a good while there, I had dreams and I was talking to my friends. I'm not sure how rational that sounds, but uh, it did, it bothered me. The disaster leaves Texas City grief-stricken. The question on everyone's lips is what could have triggered this nightmare? Now, by going deep into the official investigation, we can reveal the calamitous chain of events that led to the Texas City explosion. The first officials on the scene aren't industrial accident investigators. They're agents from the FBI. They arrive within hours of the disaster. In an era of global terrorism, the agency is suspicious of any major explosion. The Texan oil industry is a particular concern. Since 9-11, these refineries have been designated high-value targets. The potential for a terrorist atrocity is obvious. The agents fear this disaster could be the start of a new wave of domestic terrorism. They turn to eyewitnesses for the first clues. Immediately their attention is drawn by the mention of a white pickup truck. Several witnesses recall hearing the truck's engine revving loudly, though there was no sign of any driver. The agents need to know if these facts are as sinister as they sound. But just as they think they're making progress, other eyewitness statements shed further light on the case. The agents learn that six minutes before the explosion, liquid was seen spewing out of the blowdown stack, and the pickup truck was parked less than nine meters away. They realize the escaping liquid could explain the mystery of the revving engine. Normally, an engine's carburetor forces clean air together with fuel, which ignites, causing the engine to rev. But the white pickup wasn't taking in ordinary air. Its engine was flooded with petrochemical fumes from the escaping liquid. This would account for it revving in spite of the driver's absence. A single spark from the running engine is all it would take to ignite the vapor. It now looks like the escaping fluid is to blame for the blast. Terrorism no longer seems likely, and the FBI hands the investigation over to a new team. 1,900 kilometers away in Washington, D.C., is the federal agency charged with taking the job on. The Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board or CSB, was formed in 1998 to look into industrial accidents. It's independent of any other branch of government. The members of its board are appointed directly by the president and confirmed by the Senate. A team arrives in Texas City the day after the explosion. It's led by Chief Investigator Don Holmstrom. A trained lawyer with years of experience working in refineries Holmstrom is regarded as a leading expert in petrochemical safety. Over the last decade, he's investigated a string of major accidents. The press refer to him as a safety evangelist. 
the perfect man to handle the pressure of a high-profile investigation. A catastrophic incident of this magnitude certainly focuses a lot of attention from the media, uh, from the public in general, on an international level. Holmstrom knows progress will be slow. Key witnesses are either dead or injured. Much of the evidence has been destroyed in the explosion, and the blast site is unsafe. One thing at least is clear. Eyewitness testimony has placed the blowdown stack at the heart of the disaster. This was the source of the liquid that seeped under the white pickup truck. Holmstrom knows the blowdown stack is the final safety outlet for the distillation tower. Its function is to vent gases and contain small quantities of liquid. But there's no way fluid should ever overflow from the 35 meter stack. Something must have gone disastrously wrong. But what? The team needs to start gathering physical evidence from the blast site. In particular, they need to find the computer hard drive from the main processing unit. This holds a complete electronic record of the distillation process. But progress is immediately hampered. The explosion has released cancer-causing benzene gas, and it could take days for it to disperse. The investigators don't know when it will be safe for them to move in. America's oil industry is desperate for answers. Is this catastrophe a tragic one-off? Or could it be repeated elsewhere? Identical distillation towers exist in refineries across America. If they're unsafe, the oil industry could be crippled. In the uncertainty that follows, gasoline prices hit an all-time high, and the world's biggest economy is left on the brink of crisis. A huge explosion rocks the British Petroleum oil refinery in Texas City. 170 people are injured, 15 are dead. The FBI rules out the possibility of a terrorist attack. It now falls to Don Holmstrom and his team from the Chemical Safety Board to find out what went wrong. Holmstrom knows the disaster can be traced to flammable liquid that spewed out of the blowdown stack. The stack is connected to the distillation tower and Holmstrom suspects that's where the liquid came from. What he doesn't understand is how it could have reached the blowdown stack, let alone have filled it. During the distillation process, liquid in the tower should not exceed a level of two meters. Holmstrom knows that to escape, it must rise more than 46 meters above its correct level to the top of the tower. But there's a series of safeguards to prevent this happening. First, an outlet control valve automatically regulates the flow of liquid from the bottom of the tower. If it begins to overfill, the valve opens wider and the level goes down again. Second, a level indicator should provide operators in the control room with a constant update on how full the tower is. Attached to it is a high-level alarm, which should go off if the tower starts to overfill. Beyond that is a second backup alarm. The system should be foolproof. But if Holmstrom's suspicions are correct, these safeguards must all have failed. He needs to know what was going on in the tower before the blast. He begins by questioning eyewitnesses. He soon learns the distillation tower was being started up on the same day as the explosion. It's too big a coincidence to ignore. Although the startup is governed by strict safety guidelines, it's potentially a risky process. Could this be connected to the explosion? Holmstrom begins questioning the operators who worked on the startup and finds that his theory might be correct. He discovers a night shift operator broke the safety guidelines. Just after 3 a.m., an alarm went off in the control room 
warning that the liquid level was slightly over 2.5 meters. But the operator switched it off and did nothing. He tells Holmstrom that overfilling the tower and ignoring the alarm is nothing unusual. When the feed starts circulating through the system, the level in the tower often falls. He claims overfilling the tower not only saved time, but avoided the inconvenience of having to top it up later. It's common practice. He left the level at about four meters, confident it would drop back towards two meters when the day shift operator started to circulate the feed. Holmstrom has uncovered a clear breach of safety procedures, which could be linked to the explosion. But when he questions the day shift operator, the man supports his colleague. While he was on duty, he had a constant eye on the level indicator and saw nothing to concern him. It consistently showed a level of less than three meters. It looks like this line of questioning could be leading Holmstrom up a dead end. But Holmstrom decides to look more closely at the design of the level indicator. And it's here he makes his first breakthrough. He discovers the indicator suffers from a fatal design flaw. It can only measure liquid up to a height of three meters, which shows as 100% on the operator's control panel. Anything beyond this doesn't register on the level indicator. Worse still, the indicator's design means that if the liquid were to pass three meters, it could even show a drop in level. Holmstrom realizes the operator's testimony does not prove the startup was safe. He suspects he's on the right track. But even allowing for these mistakes, there should be enough safeguards to prevent an explosion. A second alarm situated above the first should go off if the liquid level passes 2.5 meters. Yet nobody recalls hearing it. Holmstrom focuses on this backup alarm. He goes through BP's work orders and discovers another critical error. The alarm had been reported as damaged before the explosion, and there's no record of it being fixed. Holmstrom now knows that of the tower's two high-level alarms, one was deactivated and the other never worked in the first place. But even with the alarm systems out of operation, there are further safeguards to prevent excess liquid from rising in the tower. The liquid level is regulated automatically by an outlet control valve. If the level gets too high, the valve automatically opens to allow more liquid out of the tower. Could this also be faulty? Without access to the blast site, the investigators cannot know for sure. Holmstrom confirms with the day shift operator that liquid did flow out of the tower at a normal rate. To his horror, he learns the operator doesn't realize he should check this. It's a serious oversight, but in itself, it's not enough to account for the disaster. Safety guidelines dictate that a supervisor should always be on hand to oversee the flow of liquid during startup. When Holmstrom speaks to the supervisor, he makes another breakthrough. Just before 10 o'clock, he received a phone call telling him his son had broken his arm. He left his post and handed over control to a colleague. Holmstrom interviews the replacement supervisor, who makes a shocking admission. He had never handled a startup before and failed to make a note of the flow out of the tower. So far, Holmstrom has uncovered slack operating practices, poorly maintained equipment, and a supervisor leaving his post at a critical moment. There's now no question in Holmstrom's mind that the flawed startup is to blame for the explosion. 
but he still lacks firm evidence to prove it. One week after the explosion, the team finally get the news they've been waiting for. They are cleared to enter the blast site. The investigators sift through the debris, taking 200 photographs as well as video footage. A lot of evidence has been destroyed in the blast. But the most important piece of evidence is intact. The hard drive from the tower's control room. It's the equivalent of an aircraft's black box and contains an electronic record of all the key processes that went on within the tower. At last, Holmstrom has the information he hopes will substantiate his theory. He immediately examines data from the outlet control valve. As suspected, it's at the heart of the problem. On the morning of the blast, instead of being set to auto, it was left closed. The valve did not regulate the flow of liquid out of the tower, as it should have. At 9.52 a.m., the day shift operator started the feed. For three hours, he pumped liquid into the tower, failing to notice none was flowing out. During this time, his supervisor also failed to notice the imbalance in the flow. It's a potentially lethal situation. But Holmstrom still needs to determine how the liquid escaped from the top of the tower. He goes back to the hard drive and finds that shortly after 1 p.m., less than 20 minutes before the explosion, the tower's pressure relief valves were forced open. These valves are designed to control gas, not liquid. The computer confirms the liquid did reach the top of the tower and escape down the gas pipes. Once the valves were open, the path was clear for it to reach the blowdown stack. It would quickly have filled the 35 meter stack and spewed out the top. Holmstrom's hunch is correct. A catastrophic series of mistakes in the startup process did cause the disaster. When BP learns what happened, the company accepts responsibility for the blast. But two months later, BP pins most of the blame on low-level workers. This leaves many in Texas City dissatisfied. They know the poor safety record of the BP refinery and feel their fellow workers have been scapegoated. They have an ally in Don Holmstrom. He agrees it's too easy to blame a handful of people. The problem with blaming an individual is that you, one could come to the conclusion that, well, we got rid of the individual and all our problems are solved. Holmstrom wants to know how long these safety problems have existed. He returns to the computer hard drive found in the wreckage. It holds a complete record of the tower's previous startups going back for years. He discovers a frightening catalogue of near misses. The records prove the night shift operator had been telling the truth. It was common practice to ignore safety guidelines during the startup process. Out of 16 previous startups, 13 had liquid levels above 3 meters, the range of the level indicator. Any of these could have ended in disaster, but managers of the refinery failed to properly investigate the malpractice. Certainly the safety culture as it existed before the incident left a lot to be desired. Next, Holmstrom turns his attention to the location of the trailer where most of the victims died. He's concerned it was sighted just 37 meters from the blowdown stack. He wants to know how BP could justify locating it in such an exposed position. To him, the risk should have been obvious. This isn't the first time workers have died in this way. In 1995, at a refinery in Pennsylvania belonging to Pennzoil, a trailer was located near two large storage tanks. When the tanks exploded, 
five workers were killed. The resulting investigation warned against placing trailers near flammable materials. But BP disregarded the warning. They decided the convenience of putting employees near the unit they were working on should override safety considerations. Holmstrom discovers BP tried to justify the trailer's location with an elaborate series of risk calculations. The company decided the trailer's safety depended on the length of time it was occupied. So even though it was dangerously close to the blowdown stack, because it was empty much of the year, the risk to employees was low. Holmstrom finds the logic deeply flawed. Certainly, if you're an occupant of a trailer and you're being sited next to a hazardous process unit, it doesn't make any difference whether you're exposed to a risk for several weeks or a year's period. It's still a risky situation for you. Lax safety practices and employees left dangerously exposed. It's a lethal combination, particularly in light of the string of fatal incidents that have haunted Texas City. The problems that existed at Texas City had been present for many years. Safety was very problematic at the plant. Workers were concerned about coming to work because of the risk of catastrophic incidents. It shouldn't be necessary to go to work every day and under the threat of death. This refinery's been killing people for years. Obviously, it was built on evil ground. They need to shut it down and put a marble statue with all the names of the dead in front of it and just walk away from it. Even before the explosion, the Texas City plant was America's most dangerous oil refinery. Since the 1970s, accidents here have killed more than 30 workers. I think these events are unrelated. Uh, there has been a few, uh, and we regret each one. However, Holmstrom believes BP's recent safety problems are related, and the trail leads directly to its most senior executives. America's worst industrial accident for a decade has killed 15 workers at BP's Texas City oil refinery. A lot of folks worried about their loved ones right now, Jerome. A tragic, tragic day in Texas City. Don Holmstrom and his team from the Chemical Safety Board are investigating a history of fatalities at the plant. Despite BP's claims to be getting to grips with its poor safety record, the team finds evidence to the contrary. In 1998, an internal memo from BP's board in London ordered all refinery managers to cut operating costs by 25%. This cost-cutting is directly to blame for the disaster. The final safety outlet in the distillation process is a blowdown stack. Despite the errors that occurred during the startup, an effective safety outlet could have averted the tragedy. But the blowdown stack is an ancient design, more than 50 years old. Holmstrom discovers that in 2002, BP decided against replacing the stack with a modern safety flare system. This cutting edge model is able to deal with overflowing liquid while the flare burns off excess gas. The new design would have prevented the disaster. This is a case of uh, a company denying the risk. They knew the hazards. Uh, they were aware of them, but when they had the opportunity to take action, they did not do so. Replacing the blowdown stack would have cost under $6 million, about a single day's production at the Texas City refinery. For the people who worked there, it would have been a small price to pay. It's people. People are the most important thing, not the plant not the corporation itself, it's the people. It was six months after the accident 
before David Crow could fully walk again. He still suffers pain from his injuries. But it's the mental scars that are taking longest to heal. He's not the same person. He was a very laid back, easy going kind of guy. And now he's very angry at the loss of his friends. It's causing us a lot of problems. Like David, Ralph Dean's wife, Alyssa, also suffered a broken back. Her gallbladder had to be removed and 20% of her body was burnt. For several weeks, doctors told Ralph she might not survive. My wife's gonna have to live with this for the rest of her life. I mean, it's, it's just a part of our life that's just always gonna be there. Well, hell yes, I'm angry. That probably won't ever go away. Eva Rowe is also struggling to cope. More than a year after the explosion, she still can't come to terms with the loss of her parents. It's really hard, you know, not having either one to lean on. But I'm glad that they're together. I wish I could still have both of them, but I couldn't pick to have one or the other. I'm very glad they're together. Since the explosion, BP has set aside more than a billion dollars to pay compensation claims. Six workers, including the original supervisor, have won libel actions after the company wrongly blamed them for the disaster. BP has appointed a new site manager in Texas City and improved its training program. It's relocated its trailers and has begun replacing blowdown stacks. The company is now carrying out a total overhaul of its global operations.